Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's first webinar in this four-part series called People and Place, hosted by the Yellowstone Gateway Museum. My name is Diane Shelfont, and I'm a volunteer and board member of the Yellowstone Gateway Museum here in Livingston, Montana. Our museum is a tremendous resource for our community. And if you're not a member, we really encourage you to consider becoming a member. There's so much that it offers besides these webinar programs. We have a fascinating digital photo archives that you can access from home, online exhibits and research services. So again, consider becoming a member and you can explore more about the natural and cultural history of Park County, Montana. Um, in a moment, I'll introduce the museum's curator, Karen Reinhardt, but first I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so that you'll know how to participate in today's program. Mm -hmm. At any time during the webinar, you'll have the opportunity to submit your questions to today's presenter, Chris Latre. Uh, your questions will be anonymous. So to submit a question, just type your question in the Q&A at the bottom of the control panel, and Karen and I will read the questions and share them with our speaker. As time allows during the presentation, Chris will address as many questions as he can, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end to do that as well. Uh, we will be recording this webinar and we'll upload it to Yellowstone Gateway Museum's YouTube channel after the event. And finally, following the webinar, you'll have an opportunity to take a very short survey. We really encourage you to take that survey because it'll help us improve this webinar series and other programs that we'll offer in the future. I'd now like to introduce Yellowstone Gateway Museum's curator, Karen Reinhardt. Thank you, Diane. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I'd like to invite all of you to register for upcoming People in Place programs on Wednesday evenings in April. Next week, April 14th, I am presenting Montana Women Making Do and Making a Difference, following the Friends of Yellowstone Gateway Museum's annual meeting. You may attend the 6.30 p.m. meeting or simply join for the 7 o'clock p.m. program. Kelly Hartman presents a Brief History of Cook City on April 21st, and Paul Shea presents Livingston and Park County, an early history on April 28th. We hope you will join us. Chris Latre is a writer and storyteller. He is a regular contributor to Montana Quarterly and a former contributor to the Missoulian and the Missoula Independent. His work has been recently featured in university journals, including Canis Magazine, Cut Bank Online, and Talking River. His first book, One Sentence Journal, Short Poems and Essays from the World at Large, won the 2018 Montana Book Award and a 2019 High Plains Book Award. His next book, Becoming Little Shell, will be published by Milkweed Editions in 2022. This book is a story of Latre's mixed race Mati heritage, a father who denied that heritage, and the community he was denied as a result. It is also a history of the state's Mati people, their largely unrecognized cultural presence on the high plains of the U.S., and finally, of the Little Shell tribe and their struggle for federal recognition. Latre is Chippewa Cree Mati and is an enrolled member of the Little Shell tribe of Chippewa Indians. He is a director on the board of the Big Sky Country National Heritage Area, serving as the official representative of the Little Shell Tribe. He also serves on the board of the Free Flow Foundation and serves as an advisor to the board of Swan Valley Connections. Born and raised in Montana, Latre grew up near Frenchtown and lives now just outside of Missoula, where he will most likely be found writing in various dive bars and coffee shops, prowling the many trails and riverbanks of the Missoula Valley, or holding down a shift as a part-time bookseller at downtown Missoula's storied bookstore, Fact and Fiction Books. Now, sit back, relax, and enjoy Montana history. Please welcome Chris Latre. All right, thanks. Thanks everybody for um, participating in this thing. I'm going to start this presentation. Um, this is a little weird for everybody doing things this way that, you know, since we're still kind of in this new pandemic world, wondering how we're going to get out of it. I much prefer doing these things, you know, face to face with people because it's easier to connect. Um, but I'm going to do my best. And I urge 
as, as Diane said at any point during the presentation, if you have a question, it would be nice to interrupt my monologue with, with other input. Um, so yeah, don't hesitate. Uh, Karen kind of covered all this stuff. This is the book that kind of got me going as far as doing events and things. Um, as she said, I'm a writer, won a couple awards with this book. Uh, it kind of launched me into, into the world of just kind of Montana literature in a way that I never really expected. Uh, and, and the whole Little Shell book project that, that she also mentioned was something that, you know, was, that I'd been kicking around with it. I don't know that I would have been able to get the attention for people to allow me to tell the story without the success of this book. So those of you who have contributed to its success by purchasing it, and I know there are a number of you, I appreciate that. And I think ultimately it's gonna be good for the little shell because, it's, because this book is certainly gonna be something that uh, allows our story to be told to a wider audience. What I didn't know at the time that I was writing it is that I grew up in what we will discuss as the Métis archipelago. So everywhere that, that I've lived and largely where my family has lived are these communities that, that we'll talk about that sprang from kind of the multicultural uh, group of people who comprise largely of what the little shell, who we are. This is our official symbol. This is what shows up on our flag. And again, from this point forward, jump in with a question if you have one. I like to start kind of at the end, really. Um, December 2019, we became the 574th federally recognized tribe after over, a, I, I put the number at 156 years as of 2019 of going back to the, to the old, Crossing Treaty of 1863 is kind of where things really started to come apart for us in our relationship with the federal government. Um, and that's because Chief Little Shell at the time, Little Shell being a hereditary title, that Chief Little Shell said he was never gonna sign another treaty with the federal government because he felt that they were always dealing unfairly with our people and with the indigenous people across the continent. So 574 is what we became in January or, or December of 2019. And January 25th of 2020 was our federal recognition celebration in Great Falls, which drew way more people than we imagined it would. So this photograph here is um, one conference room, the main conference room where the speakers were assembled and addressed the crowd. There were spillover crowds in two other rooms with like a video feed so that they could see what was happening in the main room. And, you know, I'd been going to two uh, quarterly meetings of the tribe for about three years before this happened. And, you know, we might get 50 people at the most at a meeting. So when there was probably well over a thousand people there, it was, it was quite stirring to be a part of after all of the effort that had gone through to get us to that point. Say, Chris, that we already true. have a question. All right. And the, and the question is, what are the different symbols on the flag, on the little shell flag? Oh, I'm gonna show my, let's go back here. So, you know, there's some, so the bison, obviously, be, you know, the we are a buffalo tribe. I mean, and, and we'll get into that. We, you know, a large part of what caused us to, become landless in the first place was due to so many of us off what was at the time the Turtle Mountain Reservation hunting the last remaining herds of buffalo. So that was a big part of our economy. So of course, you're going to have the bison as kind of the central piece in that figure. And then the other flag that, that you've got the Florida Lee and then you've got the shamrock. Those are related to what I'm going to talk about the Métis people kind of our mixed race heritage, our mixed culture, I prefer to call it, you know, they're on the right and then the left, you know, that's just we, your eagle feathers and, and your ceremonial staff. Um, we have a spear that has been passed through there, you know, pipes are a big part of it. So these are just kind of a collection of, of icons that represent all of the kind of different pieces that comprise who we are as a culture. I hope that answers your question. Thanks. I've never been asked it before, so I just winked <laughs> it. Back to, Cheryl, to Chairman Gerald Gray. He, 
you know, he's been our chairman since kind of the mid to late 2000s. You know, he was very involved and very driven to kind of become the guy who, who got us our federal recognition. And I don't know that we could have had a better person in that position to kind of guide us over those hurdles and, and disappointments over and over again, because we would get so close and then not make it across the finish line and then get so close again and then not make it across the finish line. So Chairman Gray and our current uh, collection of individuals who comprise our tribal council, you know, were, were critically important that they were the people who were there when, when this opportunity came. During the course of our celebration, every tribe, the other seven tribes in Montana gave us gifts and, and each of the tribal chair people spoke, kind of welcoming us, welcoming us to, you know, the, to the, to the group, to the, to the, I don't know, the overall nation, indigenous nation of North America, of federally recognized tribes. And you know, you get politicians hopping up on stage and in an election year, and that's pretty tedious. And by the time we got to the other tribes who were all very supportive in our efforts to get federal recognition, that's particularly when this is the Northern Cheyenne delegation and those three elders in the back sang an honor song to us. And that's when, you know, for me, just the emotion of, of and, and I get emotional, I'm probably gonna cry 10 or 12 times during this. and. And that's just how it's going to be. But the the opportunity to be welcomed by other Indigenous nations in a way that we had never experienced before, and or that I personally had never experienced before, was huge. You know, as, as a writer and and a poet, I talk a lot about how how literature and and poetry can connect people across, you know, generations and cultures and and millennia even. And, and when you hear an honor song from a fellow nation, sovereign nation of indigenous people singing to us was huge to me. That's, that's when it really hit. And, and, and from that point forward, it was, I don't know, it was, it was almost a blur, but it, it was, for me, it was a magical point in the whole process. So I talk a lot here to start out with about federal recognition and that's kind of how most people got to hear of the little shell is because all of a sudden these people that nobody knew anything about were in the news for federal recognition. Well, what does that even mean? First of all, it doesn't happen very often, federal recognition, and particularly when it comes to a tribe as large as we are. We've got uh, 5,400 members, enrolled members at, at a little more than 5,400 right now, I think. And there's not a roadmap for how that plays out. Um, primarily, we're dealing with like the BIA, the Bureau of Indian Affairs and IHS, which is Indian Health Services. And the way those federal organizations are organized, you have representatives who are responsible for for vast swaths of territory. Like there's something like seven groups that the BIA is divided into and nine regions that the IHS is divided into. And my, my numbers might be a little off, but, but that's, that's the idea is that you've got agents that are responsible for all the tribes within these regions and they're underfunded and no one really knows what they're doing. So it is a slow process, but ultimately what it gives us is access to health benefits. That's where the IHS comes into. We get access to other federal programs that that are available only to federally recognized tribes, which might be, you know, money for projects and things like that. We were already getting things from the state, like a state tobacco prevention program that was funded by the state because we were recognized by the state of Montana in 2000. So we were already getting a little bit of that, but, but federally, you know, it gives us access to a lot bigger pool of resources. Land, we get land that will be held in trust and again, I forget if it's, I think it's 200 acres, but then the little boy says, but it's actually 400, but I think it's 200 that we actually have to pay for. Um, but then it gets put into trust, just like reservations, every other native reservation in, in North America is. Um, 
just that weird jurisdictional overlap because now we are also a sovereign nation, which gives us the right to make our own sovereign laws. We can handle our own enrollment process, all these different things that, uh, that a sovereign nation anywhere in the world technically is able to do, we can do now as our own sovereign nation. Like when we got together for our, for our celebration, you know, the word, you know, the, the speech was we're building a country from the ground up. That's kind of what we're doing. Um, and it also that there are legal obligations that the federal and the state have towards us. They can't just roll up on us and do whatever they want. As a sovereign nation, we have a political relationship now with the federal government that we did not enjoy previously, which gives us bargaining power. You know, maybe not as much as, as is owed us, but but that's part of the project process. That's part of the process. I think that all native tribes are engaging in right now when it comes to sovereignty issues, as we see these struggles over pipeline access and water rights and all of these things that that really we have sovereignty to have be able to dictate how things play out on our land. So it's it's a jurisdictional mess that we are suddenly in the middle of that we are also thankful to be in the middle of. I think the biggest thing that happened to us though is that it got us in line to be uh, part of the CARES Act COVID relief that came about you know, after it last summer um, because of the pandemic. So we went from a tribe who in the last you know, couple decades would literally fund our operations with bake sales and raffles to suddenly having $25 million in the bank because of the CARES Act COVID relief. But there were, of course, you know, stipulations for how that money could be used. It had to somehow be related to COVID and, and, and health related to COVID. So what are the things we did? Some of the things we did, we got checks for the first time as Little Shell members, which if we had our lives or our income or our health impacted financially by COVID, we were able, we had a couple rounds of checks where members got. We did some infrastructure infrastructure upgrades, like in our cultural center, where, you know, putting in a, a industrial kitchen so that we could serve our people better. Um, upgrades in our office building where our tribal operations operate out of. We did some infrastructures up upgrades up there for, you know, for HVAC things and things like that. And again, making things healthy, like like remodeling our restrooms. All those little details that that people tend to not pay attention to until something grave happens like like a major health crisis. Speaking of which health facility, we purchased a former pet clinic and are remodeling to be our own health facility so that our members will have a little shell owned, a little shell operated facility to go to for health care. We purchased some delivery vehicles so that we could deliver food, you know, to some of these outlying communities where we have elders living that that were confined to their homes. You know, we a couple delivery trucks, vans, so that we could transport people, you know, to other healthcare facilities until ours are com completed. Really, just a bunch of projects that, if we had had to wait for the process to play out for, you know, resulting from our federal recognition probably would have taken decades to get some of these launched that we were able to just hit the ground running and make happen. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a sad situation to benefit from, but, but without that CARES Act, there wouldn't be a lot of progress moved forward as far as how our tribe can kind of gather together and help our, our members. Chris, we do have another question, okay. and, and that is, how would you suggest tribal members who aren't in Montana get involved? Get involved with the tribe, I guess. Um, so I live in Montana, but I'm still three hours away, and I never see any little shell in my day-to-day -day life. And I think situations like what we're enjoying right now with Zoom um, can be very important to how we get together. There's a great book that David Troyer wrote called Heartbeat of Wounded Knee, where he's talking about Native nations in the United States across the board and the fact that everybody thinks that we are extinct and we're not, and we're still out there and we're still doing things. And a big part of what has helped us stay connected has been the internet. 
and it, it is a, it's a to, to be involved with a little shell is like any other kind of civic engagement you have to be willing to be inconvenienced by participating in things that maybe don't really work out with your schedule so you have to decide do i want to be a good little shell and if i'm going to do that i'm going to start participating in events online i'm going to reach out i could any little shell member right now could text Gerald Gray and they're going to get an answer from him or email Gerald Gray and they're going to get an answer from him. So it's a matter of just reaching out because there's so much going on right now that, that it's difficult for our tribal council to reach out to people. We need more people contacting the tribal council through our Facebook page, through email, be willing to recognize that it might be moving slower than we would prefer and that it might be frustrating. But as we said, we're building a country from the ground up, which is full of challenges, but it also is an opportunity that whoever gets the opportunity to kind of state who they are and what they're going to be. And yes, that's a long winded answer to say, ask not what your country can do for you you know i mean that makes sense it's it's a great line but it works for us too chris that's great and the person said thank you and um and they're going to contact uh gerald so thank you and i'm happy to talk to people too i you know i'm pretty easy to find chrislatre.com i have a newsletter that i communicate through people i'm on twitter i'm on instagram I'm off and on Facebook. I, you know, I feel there are people who have carried the little shell torch to get us to this point. Some of those people didn't survive to see us get federal recognition. And I think there are a number of us who are willing to kind of pick up that torch and carry it forward. And whether it's me or other tribal council members, we're out there and we're happy to talk to people. I mean, I'm not a tribal council member. I'm just, we'll get to what I am, but, um, I mean, I think that's even the next slide. I'm not, I'm not an academic. I'm not a historian. I'm just a storyteller. And, you know, I, I, it's made, it's important to me to tell the story of our people. And I feel, you know, an obligation to do this, you know, because like I said, there are people who didn't make it, who, who gave their lives, you know, devoted was their life's work was to try and get federal recognition to the Little Shell people. You talk to any Little Shell elder or anybody who grew up in a community, one of the communities where there were Little Shell or Métis people living together. And that's the story you hear over and over is like my whole life, I heard that any day now is recognition is coming any day. And there were people that were flying to DC back and forth that that really built the structure that we were able to climb to finally get to the top of that. Um, so yeah, those of us who are moved to do so do have an obligation to continue the work. And, and for me, it's, it's things like this, it's writing, it's being proud to say in a, in an introduction that yes, I am Métis and I'm enrolled with a little, little shell tribe and I, I am not speaking for them all the time, but I am certainly speaking from them. Nicholas Vrooman is one of those people that we wouldn't have gotten here without. He wasn't Little Shell, but he was more Little Shell than I am. I mean, if we were able to do things, and I think ultimately we will in a more traditional sense where we can enroll people with none of this blood quantum or any of that kind of garbage that kind of dictates tribal enrollment in North America, Nicholas would have been Little Shell. He wrote the book, The Whole Country Was One Robe, The Little Shell Tribes of America, which came out in 2012, which is the official written history of our people. And Nicholas did more for getting the information together that we had to submit to the federal government to get our recognition than anybody. And sadly, he passed away five months before we got federal recognition. I think he knew in his heart that this time we were going to get there, but he, he, he didn't survive. And he was largely my mentor. I wouldn't be here doing this right now if it wasn't for Nicholas. I met him at the Montana Festival of the Book in 2012 when this book came out. And I, at the time, had heard of the little shell, kind of knew this, kind of knew that. But in the 20 minutes of his presentation, I learned more about where I came from than I had learned, you know, in, in the 40 years prior. 
and he is he was gracious with his time generous with his knowledge i approached him after his talk told him who i was and he said yeah you are definitely you are related to all these people and he signed my book it's yours and you know that when when he passed a lot of us you know we're, we're pretty heartbroken and i think one of our goals this book is out of print i mean you see it online for like 300 bucks i would love to see this book go back in print because it is an academic version of a story that i, I think kind of overwhelms all but the most most engaged people to want to know every date and every detail and all i'm trying to do with my little shell book is take the work that people like nicholas did and kind of recapitulate it into something so that more people understand who we are and where we came from so yeah nicholas roman is would if if we carved faces into a little shell mountain his face would be on there we would never do that thing about history and this is all stuff that nicholas told me is that nobody knows about the things that that went on on the northern plains and and all the people who lived there and all of the and all of the cultures that were overlapping there nicholas told me and this is a quote that there's room for a dozen professional historians to do a lifetime of work here and not bump into each other that's how much history has just been glossed over um and a, a large part of that you know as nicholas said was the result of of social Darwinism, you know, you had, you know, up until World War II, you had a pretty much white, uh, white control of, of what's the word I'm looking for? Academia. That's it. I was going to back up and look at my other slide. Yeah. Academia was very much uh, a, a white culture in the United States for decades and decades. And it wasn't until, um, World War II happened and a lot of working class men primarily went into the military and came out in the GI Bill and they were able to go to college and kind of break down some of these ivory towers and have working class people going into things like history and, and being able to determine that, you know, that there's more to history than just what the upper class had an influence on. So a lot of these people and, and, and Nicholas was, was one of them are the ones who dug a little deeper and were able to determine, you know, um, more depth to the history that was going on in, in that period. And, and even now, you know, there's more stuff that gets uncovered every day. Even these pipelines, you know, as, as tribal historians and tribal archeologists go out to map the, 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 the route that these folks have chosen to take these these pipelines and we and find sites of villages and campsites and all things like that. It was much more populated and active part of the of the continent than than people realize. I'm kind of rambling. I'm probably going to run out of time. I better hurry. It all starts out with the Métis, which most of the little shell that I know identify as Métis. So like when I'm out there prowling around the riverbanks, this is kind of how I imagine myself. This is kind of the classic Hudson Bay. He's got his blanket coat on. He's got his traps. He's got his gun. He's got his beaver cap on. Obviously an indigenous guy. You know, th this is kind of the iconic image of, of who we are. Métis means French for mixed blood. And you'll see it two ways. If you see it in a small M, it's literally the, the French word for mixed. If you see it capitalized, it means the Métis Nation, which is a cultural group that is recognized in Canada, but is not recognized in the United States. So like my tribal ID lists me as Chippewa Cree, but I identify as, as Métis. Um, we are a unique cultural group that, that came, a new, unique cultural indigenous people who came to be post contact with post-European contract contact. So it was a case of primarily French and, and English, some English, some Welsh explorers and traders that came over to North America, you know, in the early 1500s, 1600s and started marrying native women and a cultural, a, a unique culture that bred the cultural attributes of the indigenous people and the European people to kind of mix the two worlds and become something different. 
we had our own language, um, Nichif, which is kind of a blend of French and Cree and Ojibwe and, and, you know, is still spoken in Canada. I don't know how many people even speak it in the United States. I know the little shell, the language that we teach in our language classes is Ojibwe. I would love to learn Michif. I would love to learn Ojibwe. Um, but yes, the, the Métis people had their own language and you will sometimes see Métis people identified as Michif people as well. We came out of the, the Red River Valley, the Turtle Mountain area, uh, you know, North Dakota and Minnesota. Red River Carts is kind of our claim to fame. There are some historians who say that the Red River Cart is the initial evidence of wheel use by indigenous people in North America. You know, the Europeans and the historians at the time would say, well, you guys didn't even know how to use the wheel. But we didn't need to because we were a river people until we moved out into the plains. You know, we were using a, a craft called the birch bark canoe, which was largely superior to anything that was being used to cross waterways and lakes and rivers like our landscape dictated from anything that was being used in, in Europe. So it wasn't until we moved out onto the plains, you know, it's kind of hard to hunt buffalo from a birch bark canoe. So, you know, we developed these carts that would enable us to bring back all of these things as trade goods that we, we would gather on buffalo hunts. So you would see you know, Métis people go out even with their own cattle herds that they would drive with them to go out and hunt buffalo that they would then render into hides and pemmican and all these things. It was a huge part of our economy. Say, Chris, we have another question. Sure. And, and that is, are you aware of what band of Cree Little Shell Band members are from? Well, we, we primarily like the Rocky Boy. So we're related to the Rocky Boy Chippewa Cree. And, you know, okay. Cree is one of those words that that um, pretty much anybody from Canada, people started calling Cree. So you get up oh. into Canada and and the, design, the tribal designations get split out much more detailed than what we've got in the United States. So I don't hmm. know, you know, other people probably know better than I do as far as those direct uh, designations of which band of Cree we come from. But, you know, there was so much, and, and we'll get into that here in these next couple of slides, of, of just intermix of territory and people. So no, I don't know if there's any specific. My guess is that there are, are more than we would choose to count. Okay. I think if you, I think if your indigenous side of your family is tied more to the Cree than, than the than the Métis part, you might have a better idea. But a lot, a lot of times you'll see people who are specific Ojibwe slash Métis as well, because again, like I said, the mixing among bands and 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 territories that would happen. One of your um, audience members um, questions whether maybe it's the um, Mempina band, the Pembina, sorry. Well, Pembina. that's Chippewa. So the Pembina Chippewa, we are absolutely part of that. And I'm getting to that part here in, in soon. Yeah, so the Pembina Chippewa, Ch Chief Little Shell was one of the primary leaders of the Pembina Chippewa that, that and, and I have a map, you know what, I'll just start jumping ahead here. We'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> All right. Um, it, it starts out with the Hudson Bay Company in 1670 when they incorporated and controlled like like it was their own country, a separate country, just a huge swath of what is now Canada and the United States. And that's where all of these mixed marriages began happening and where this culture sprang from. I mean, when you see like around the Missoula Valley, like, you know, it, pretty much anywhere where people talk about uh, French Canadian or French trappers or French explorers, 90% of the time you're talking about Métis people. You didn't have that many just French, fresh migrated here out exploring. It was it was Métis people who had been part of the Hudson's Bay Company and were building this culture for a hundred years, you know, before, again, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but this is where it starts, 1670s. There, here's a map of, of you know, the, the, Territory extended down into what is United States now, but but the Hudson Bay people had had outposts all over the north and down into what is now the United States. But it was primary what we call Rupert's Land, which was Hudson Bay down into the Great Lakes region and into the Turtle Mountains and the Red River Valley. And that's where we come from. 
Pierre Lavrandry was 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 a French guy who so the two people who the, the two guys who started the Hudson Bay Company originally went to France and said, hey, we have this idea for it. And France said no. So they went to England and England's the one who said, yeah, go for it. And it was became a huge money making thing. So the French send this sent this guy Pierre Lavrandry into this territory to see what was going on. And this is, you know, in the 1738 is when he arrives in the Turtle Mountains. And, you know, his goal was to go farther west, but didn't quite make it. Um, but then in the 1740s, two of his sons did make it out on the prairies and are, and are considered to be the first Europeans to see the Rocky Mountains north of New Mexico. That's not necessarily true because they just happened to be the first white dudes who kept journals and saw the Rocky Mountain front. You know, that's kind of the important thing. You got to be the, the one who's writing stuff down if you want to get credit. But but there are likely white explorers who were, who were seeing that ground long before the La Verandres got there. And this is a painting that I came across. This is the two sons of Pierre La Verandre, you know, out looking, you, know, you see the, the Rocky Mountain front there in the distance. And one of the things I love about this part of the country is that, that you could go find a spot out around Great Falls or central Montana and see a scene that looks a lot like that even today. So I, I, it's one of those moments when you realize that while you're talking 1700s and 1800s, it sounds so long ago, it really wasn't that long ago. The Catholics played a large role in kind of identifying Métis culture, but maybe not in the ways that some people think they did. So, you know, the French were Catholic and often, as I describe it, the bloody tip of the spear point of colonialism was typically a missionary and missionaries came and, and you know, the, the father in the relationship, it was usually a European father with a native woman that began these families and they would, sure, they would take on the religion of, of the father, but the indigenous people were also retaining their own religion. So it wasn't about changing this view for that view. It's like, I want this and I'm going to add this because we're not monotheistic. We're polytheistic and we're animistic and we are going to select, we're going to take power from any spiritual source we can. And that was one of the main kind of spiritual differences between the indigenous people of North America and the colonialists is the colonialists couldn't grasp that it wasn't one or the other. It, it, it could be everything. And you see that play out even in the little shell. Um, we have members who pursue a true, you know, indigenous Ojibwe spirituality versus a very strong contingent still of Catholics, Métis Catholics who are enrolled with, with the Little Shell tribe. You know, Father DeSmit is, is often given credit for being the guy who brought Catholicism to like the Bitterroot Valley, but, you know, the Métis traders had already been up and down that valley for a hundred years before DeSmit even got there. And if you look like right in the center of that little drawing, which was this illustration was made by one of the priests who was with DeSmit, right in the center is a, is a Red River cart with a couple of horses on it. DeSmit was guided to the Bitterroot Valley by a Métis guide. So that's one of the things that, that Nicholas Ruman would often talk about is that every point in history you know, in this period of history, you've got a Métis guide leading people to a certain point and trading them off to another Métis guide who leads this other group of people into this other part of the landscape. So that's kind of this, the hidden story there. And often you see these illustrations from the period and, and there's Red River carts there. So there's like these little Easter eggs of how we were involved with all these things playing out, yet we've never gotten the credit for it. This is another example. This is a photo I took. That's Mount Jumbo in Missoula. And through there, that's East Missoula, kind of the lower right. That's the, that's Hellgate Canyon, which was named by Métis. You know, the story is French trappers and French traders. Well, it was Métis who named it Hellgate Canyon for how rough a place it was to get through because of the Blackfeet, primarily. Um, and again, it's one of those things, this, what we, this corridor from east to west through these mountains and along the Clark, Clark Fork River. And 
and you know what is Mullen Road now? You know those all started as 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 trading trails among indigenous people. It's like an indigenous super highway where all of these tribes would trade with each other from east to west. And 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 you know there's a lot of talk about what I call kind of the zoo enclosure view of indigenous territory, where we like to think like you know as you're on the Missouri River and here we have the Lakota people and coming up on your left, we have the Cheyenne and pretty soon, you know, keep your heads down because we're going to be in Blackfeet country. Yes, tribes had their territories, but there was all kinds of overlapping territory and shared hunting grounds and shared resources like obsidian in, in Yellowstone Park was used by, you know, they, they find shards of obsidian from Yellowstone in Florida, you know, so, so there were all kinds of, of, commerce taking place in North America that that we just don't think of as happening you know before white people got here and taught the, the savages how to trade and and our region was largely like that as well hey Chris there's another question it's a, a question is do you know where uh, this person can get information about West Side Indian camp in Hamilton and that's where that person's mother was born. West Side Indian Camp in Hamilton. You know, I would contact the folks up at the, on the Flathead Reservation, the CSK. Mm -hmm. I personally don't know, but you know, they've, they've got some good cultural people there. Maybe go up to the museum and ask around. Great advice. Mm -hmm. Where am I? So the 1850s, so this is a Red River settlement, 1850, 1860s. So you've got a fort with regular houses. You've got people living traditionally in teepees and, and tents out back, as well as oxes pulling Red River carts. So this is this, you really start to see this, this kind of changing overlap of traditional plains culture and European house culture, for lack of a better term. And, and, and this is, you know, this mix of, of multiple things to become something unique. So displayed just in how people are living at this time. Here's a old photograph from the period of some Métis traders with Red River carts kind of taking a breather out on the plains. Isaac Stevens plays a large role from pretty much, you know, Minnesota to the Pacific Ocean. So in 1853, he was named the governor of Washington Territory, which at the time, Western Montana was part of. And he took a gig as a surveyor to map the railroad route from like Minneapolis to Seattle. And that trip included making treaties like the Hellgate Treaty of 1855, which happened out here like three miles from where I'm sitting right now at Council Grove off Mullen Road. And you see the names involved like, like Higgins and Warden were people that were involved in here. John Mullen was part of Isaac Stevens's group of men that were, that were part of this surveying trip. And John Mullen went on to be the guy who built the Mullen Road and, and, and Higgins and Warden were in Walla Walla. And after the Mullen Road was built, they came back as traders and created, you know, established the first trading post, which became Missoula Hellgate Durand, it's called, which is right behind the Hellgate trading post convenience store off Mullen Road. So right where the, the, Bitterroot dumps into the Clark Fork right at that confluence is where the first settlement was. But Stevens was the guy who was coming through here and talking to all these indigenous people. And when he was up on the Missouri, he was making arrangements with the tribes south of the Missouri for, okay, you guys are going to be here. We're going to give you this shared territory here. Blackfeet are going to be here. The plan was is that once he got west, they were gonna come back and decide, okay, how are we gonna allocate territory for all of you people, which was our people, the Pemba and the Chippewa and the Métis people, how are we gonna allocate your territory north of the Missouri River? Well, what happened is the Civil War happened and Stevens was killed 
And after the Civil War, the United States said, you know what, we're not going to make treaties with indigenous people anymore. Those days are behind us. And, you know, you go into the 1870s where it's it's kind of total war genocide was the was the plan for the for the rest of the people remaining. Um, so we never had the opportunity to work out those details that that Stevens kind of had in mind. And what that did is when, you know, post-Civil War is, is what Nicholas Ruman coined the Métis Archipelago. And, you know, an archipelago being a collection of islands in a certain area. Well, in this case, it was islands of communities. Uh, towns like Lewistown, which I'll talk about a little bit more, which was founded by Métis people. Anaconda, the Bitterroot, you know, up and down the Bitterroot, there were Métis people living among the Salish. Plains, Montana, which where my grandparents ultimately ended up, was originally called White Horse, White Horse Plains. The VFW hall there is White Horse Plains, VFW number, whatever the number is. But that was named for the town White Horse Plains on the Canadian side of the Turtle Mountains, you know, north of, of North Dakota. And people moved from there to Plains, Montana, and just took the name of their town with them. It was ultimately, you know, changed to just shorten to just Plains. Deer Lodge was a major Red River, Métis, the Deer Lodge Valley, Métis re resettlement zone. Johnny Grant from the Grant Coors Ranch. Johnny Grant was a very successful cattle rancher and he was Métis, he was Red River Métis. And in Nicholas's book, uh, The Whole Country Was One Robe talks about when Johnny Grant, you know, sold to Conrad Coors and returned to the, to the Red River Valley. It, it was like a military campaign as far as all the wagons and the guards and the families and people just relocating from Deer Lodge back to the Red River Valley. So all of these towns growing up, as I mentioned in the beginning, I was growing up here without knowing how connected we all were. This is a census from Frenchtown where I grew up from 1860. And I keep wanting to point at the screen. It's, you guys can't see what I'm pointing at. So but, but if you look under race of these folks, you've got W for white, you've got red for Indian, and then the HBs all stand for half-breed. So, you know, these families were, I mean, that's what we were called, half-breeds, breeds, breed towns is where we lived, uh, moccasin flats, things like that. But Frenchtown, where I grew up, was settled by Métis people that, that had come from the Red River Valley, gone out west, like to the Pacific Northwest, and then when troubles there with indigenous folks, they relocated back to Frenchtown. There was actually two Frenchtown at the time that Frenchtown was founded in the late 1850s, one where it is now and one in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and I grew up there with all of these family names that were all old Métis family lines like Deshaun, Lavoy, and Sear. We didn't know it. I didn't know it. Who knows if any of them knew it? The ones who knew were the elders and they weren't talking. So that's wow. how these kind of campaigns to eliminate people and cultures create elders that at, at a point in their life, they could be deported or killed for admitting who they are. And we lose our language. We lose our culture. And that's largely what happened to the little shell and how we became landless in the first place. But this is that map of the Pembina Chippewa territory that stretched from basically the border of Minnesota across North Dakota and a little bit into Montana. Chris, we have a question that's, sure. um, it came in a little bit earlier, but it's very much yeah. about what you're talking about. This person says, I have a similar personal history as Chris. My family kept our heritage to our own family and mostly kept a secret and not discussed. I'm proud of our heritage and I'm able to explore it now, but, um, and able to explore it now, but she is gone. Um, is there a way to connect somehow to learning the spirituality of the little shell? Any recommendations would be much appreciated. Well, we do have a cultural committee tied to our tribal council. And I would say that is one of the things that is, that is most important to many of us in reestablishing our connection back to our spiritual roots, I would say in the Turtle Mountains. And there are people there who we, you know, work with to try and reestablish, you know, like it was illegal for us to, to, to do our spiritual celebrations. 
um, the year is escaping me, but, but it was late into the, I want to say the 1960s before we could legally celebrate mm. our traditional dances and things like that. Wow. Um, so that was part of what was taken from us. You know, it's mm-hmm. not so much that, that we lost the connection, that connection was forcibly taken from us. And mm-hmm. it was pretty much all we could do to survive. And, and one of the things that I love that I've learned in, in the process of researching my book is like Hill 57 in Great Falls, um, where our, our cultural center is. Hill 57 is Dwayne Reed, who is, who is our, our uh, archeological, he has a official title, but I'm terrible with title. He's like our archeology span dude. He uh, did a, a master's project on Hill 57 and Hill 57, you know, you, you look at it as like, well, this is just where all the poor Indians lived. Well, we were there because we have cosmological uh, uh, prophecy and, 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 and just all of that knowledge that goes back more than a thousand years, these old birch bark maps that show these landmarks and river bottoms, river drainages, and Hill 57 is part of it. So it isn't so much that we were driven there. That's where we made our stand. That's where we continued the business of being the people we are. That's where we had a place because we were poor and nobody wanted to deal with us that we could still practice in secret the things that we were doing. And it wasn't just us. Other people from all over the region would come and practice their religions and practice their medicine where they weren't allowed to do it out in the open anywhere else. So (laughs) Hill 57 is like this hugely important place to us because it was all underground. You know, we're running out of time. I should probably just say, open it up to questions. I'll just kind of flip through these sides. That's Chief Little Shell, who was the guy who was ultimately in charge when we were cheated out of our recognition. So what happened is, you know, the McCumber Commission, uh, they wanted to do what's called the 10 cents treaty. They wanted to buy a bunch of land from the Pembina Chippewa at 10 cents an acre and Little Shell said, no, we won't do it for less than a dollar. So the McCumbered guy who was the bureaucrat from Washington in charge of that found 30 Chippewa who would sign the treaty, said they were chiefs, the treaty gets signed and anybody who wasn't on the reservation at that time was disenrolled. So that mm-hmm. included Little Shell who was in Fort Benton at the time uh, with his band but then it also involved all the other Chippewa bands that were related to Little Shell who weren't on the reservation at that time so that's why you know like when we got our federal recognition and there were a lot of these news articles coming out I felt like we're kind of like the Wikipedia version because it was all tied to what Chief Little Shell himself and the people that were directly around him but at that time we already had enclaves living in the front range outside of Shoto. There were already people living in the Great Falls area. There were already people in Deer Lodge. There were already people in Plains, Frenchtown, all over. And we all comprised what is the little shell today. So Chris, a couple, a couple more questions came up. One about the census that you showed earlier, and it was just sort of a side question, but the person wants to know if Brown on, on that census was actually Lebrun, maybe a, a name change. See, that's one of the things. And, and even that book came out of this old book that was published in like 1977 called Frenchtown Valley Footprints. And that's one of the things you run into with this stuff is misspellings. Like my Latre was originally spelled like L-E-T-R-I-E-L-L-E. Hmm. And so they get changed phonetically. You know, you have Indian agents out there that can't spell their own name, let alone somebody else with a weird French sounding name. So you can have the same person and carrying like half a dozen different versions of the same name, depending on what document you're reading. So that is another part that makes it so difficult to determine these lineages and and who was really who. So, So another person says, when I asked my dad what nationality we are, he laughed and said, we're Heinz 57. Could that be where the name Hill 57 originated? 
it, it, it is. There was a guy oh. uh, that that was a pickle salesman for Heinz 57 and him and his family would go up on the top of this and they made a big, you know, like the <laughs> M on the side of the mountain in Missoula or any of these towns that have a, a, a letter on this. You know, right now in Great Falls, there's a GF near where the 57 was. And, and he put a 57 up there. Um, this is back like in the 20s. Um, and it just stuck. And all the Indians that lived up there became the Hill 57 Indians. Huh. So if he's saying their nationality is the Heinz 57, excuse me, then, then you probably are a little shell. <laughs> or, or, or Chippewa Cree, like from Rocky Boy. You know, Rocky Boy, when it was established, there wasn't a land for every, enough land for everybody. So, you know, another kind of 50,000 foot level description you can give the little shell is the people who just, there wasn't enough room to put on Rocky Boy. Wow. Because we're related to those folks too. Hmm. And, and again, you know, we, being a Buffalo culture, that was a large part of what drove us to kind of be living on the fringes and, and scavenging for garbage and living outside of slaughterhouses and getting refuse from there just to survive on. All of our lands had been taken. Our primary source of our primary economic engine was gone, the Buffalo. Uh, and, and, you know, in that Chippewa or the Cree Deportation, Deportation Act of 1896, we were literally rounded up from all over Montana and put on trains and shipped to Canada, which is kind of like our own version of the Trail of Tears. Just about every tribe has a version of the Trail of Tears. And that was ours. And, you know, we talk a lot about the horrible image of the Salish in 1891 being driven over what's Higgins Bridge now on their way to the Flathead Reservation for the, you know, the last group that left the Bitterroot Valley. Well, five years later, they rounded up a bunch of Métis folks and French people, anyone that they thought was either mixed or, or Northern Plains Indian and not enrolled and not like Blackfeet or, or Assiniboine or, or any of those folks, they blamed as being Canadian Indians and deported them to Canada. And then a lot of us would just make our way back and either live on the fringes of these communities like Hill 57 or kind of marry into and integrate on the on the established reservation. So like at our celebration, I was surprised by how many of my friends I know from CSK or, or my Blackfeet friends, all with relatives who were little shell because we hid out where wherever we could find a place to hide out. Wow. And Somebody else says, we can tell a bit about what this process has meant to you personally. It's very interesting. Are there any museums dedicated to the Métis? This one right here in Lewistown. So Lewistown was founded in 1879 by a group of Métis families from the Red River Valley. And they realized at that point that the Buffalo days were over and they decided they were going to be an agricultural people. And that is where I directly come from, is the parents, great-grandparents, of my grandparents on both sides, my grandmother and my grandfather on my father's side were part of those families. Um, and there's a little museum in Lewistown that has a section devoted to the Métis who, who you know, founded it. Um, like this Reeds Fort was built by my great, great grandfather, uh, Mose Latre or Moses Latre or Moise Latre, however you wanna say it. I refer to him as Mose. And, you know, he had something like 99 grandkids or something like that when he died. And, you know, just like for an anecdote, you know, I, in this presentation, I don't talk about it so much because it's more my little shell book and my family. But, you know, my dad always denied that we were related to anybody, uh, denied that we were native at all. But like I was at the Buffalo Jump Visitor Center in Ulm, which is just south of, of, of Great Falls. And... Um, the ranger working there ringing up a thing I was buying said, oh, Latre, are you related to Moe's Latre? And I said, yeah, that's my great, great grandfather. And she said, oh, mine too. So, you know, the story that I grew up with that we weren't related to any of these Latres is, is false because we were related to all of them. We we're all related. There's Moe's here and my great, great grandmother, Susan, who was actually a Cinnaboyne and was adopted by white parents and grew up Catholic. She was adopted as an infant found on the, um, I'm gonna start crying, so I'm not even gonna say anymore. She was found on the plains as an infant 
allegedly abandoned by a group fleeing the cavalry from the reservation. And that is one of the things that concerns me with, with who do we wanna be as a nation when we choose what the little shell are gonna be about? Because, the th and, and, and maybe this is where we end it, I don't know, but the things that, that were done to us, we continue to do as Americans. You know, taking children from parents, that, who knows if that's the fact? Was she abandoned? What really happened to her parents? Were they killed? Was she just simply taken from them? You can ask that question of hundreds of children on our southern border today. And it's a, it's a, it's a process that just keeps repeating and keeps repeating. And I feel like right now, maybe there's a little bit more awareness of people trying to recognize that all the smoke that the people in Washington, D.C. want to blow up our asses about how great the United States is. We've never been great. We have always treated people that had disadvantages or had something we wanted more than they were able to defend. We've always treated them kind of at the end of the spear and at the end of the gun all over the world. Doesn't mean we can't be great. But we really have to look deep inside ourselves and determine, is this who we want to be? And that, for me, is a little shell that I have a personal bone to pick with any idea that we have ever been just this shining city on the hill. Because I can look at my family and say, this happened to this woman in this picture. And what were their lives like? These are all Latres. And I'm going to jump forward to uh, these headstones. That's my great grandmother who was born in 1896 when her people were being rounded up and put into cattle cars and shipped to Canada. And when the money ran out, they were forced marched to Canada. What was her life like? And you look that she died in 1989. I met her once. It wasn't that long ago. You know, we think of all these things that played out on the, on the plains of, of North America as something that is ancient history. And there are people, I met her you know, and that was her life. I don't know. I, I just get on a roll about this because it's, it's a story that particularly in that part of the country, nobody knows about. Who knows about the Cree Deportation Act of 1896? You know, is that taught in schools? I never learned it. I'm sorry, I'm taking so much time. Those are the, yeah, that's the Bear Paw Mountains where Chief Joseph kind of ended the, the Nez Perce run to Canada. There's Hill 57 way back in the day when there were just a few people living there. Dwayne Reed is, does this great overlap of these maps of satellite imagery. So I've taken from like aircraft going back to like the 19, I think it goes back into the 1920s when it was still very primitive as far as the trail systems and you can start overlapping these airline photos you know aircraft photos and see just the community start to just absorb you know all the trails going down to the to the Missouri River and stuff from where people lived on Hill 57 and that's just going back to the 20s and you know you go back another 100 years or 200 years and and, and there was just a lot of activity around there I love this photo this is from Nicholas's book this sums up, you know, what was happening in the 1890s. You have the wealthy, this is, this is from Butte, I think, yeah. And, and he's looking at these poor native people. You know, those are probably Métis people. And you just see the contrast between who had it and who didn't in the 1890s in Montana. Things play out. You know, there were, you know, in the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s, there were efforts made to try and get, you know, federal recognition, you know, money would run out, wars would happen, progressive attitudes wanted to do something for our people, you know, I didn't even talk about the Louis Real rebellion, bottom line is, is that like I said, for 156 years, we kept running into the wall and running into the wall. And it took almost the perfect storm of the right people, the right time, the right money, and the right 
opportunity for folks to finally say enough is enough. It's been over a hundred years. We deserve our federal recognition. And like I said, that happened. And I'd love to field some more questions. There's so many people have um, have jumped in just to thank you to um, to make family connections, to um, make comments like the Little Shell Tribe is resilient. Um, many many words of thanks. Um, one one specific question um, about the bison: um, Were the Little Shell guaranteed any rights to hunting bison? in treaties with the federal government more generally, is that an aspect of Little Shell culture that the tribe is trying to reboot or retain? So we did, we were not part of those. So, so like the, the treaties that Stevens was doing in the 1850s was a large part of, of, you know, and then there were a bunch of treaties going on with all the other tribes at the same time, you know, like the, with, with the Blackfeet and the Lakota and all, all those people we never got in on any of those treaties. Like I said, so hmm. so initially, yeah, the treaties, the old crossing treaties, where they were trying to divide up, you know, Lakota territory and Ojibwe territory, um, is when Little Shell at the time, Little Shell two, I think he was, said, "We're not doing this anymore because you keep reneging on your promises," hmm. and we never signed any treaty after that. Okay. One thing I want to point out is, you know, resilience is one of those words that I don't really like. I get the spirit of it, but to me, resilience is passive. Resilience is you're kind of letting things happen and, and kind of overcoming it. I recently heard on kind of a spiritual podcast of a friend that a friend of mine does the term uh, patient endurance which I like that better because patient is active. Endurance is active. You're not just kind of letting things happen. You're choosing to say, you know what? Our time is gonna come and you better watch out. And that's how I like to describe the story of the little shell is patient endurance. It was inevitable that we were gonna get federal recognition. And you know, now is our time. I feel like it's our time across the continent for indigenous people. We're the ones who are leading the charge on a lot of these things. You know, we see fires burning up all across the West and people are like, oh, maybe we should listen to the, how the Indian people were doing it for thousands of years before, you know, we started screwing up the landscape, you know, water protection. Uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, didn't she just say yesterday that that the next wars were gonna be fought over water. And yet we continue to like, can even consider that these pipelines of oil are a smart idea going through watersheds that can be destroyed by one leak. So it's asinine. It's time for people to start listening to the way we were doing things all along. God, I'm all fired up tonight. <laughs> and you know, and I know it's hard to, but if I, do you have access to the Q and A? Can you see them, Chris? Can you pull them up? Oh, let's see. Whoops. There we go. Yeah. So, so you might want to read through a few of those. There's, again, family connections, a lot of, um, a lot of gratitude for the presentation. There's a way we can save those, right? Yeah, I think so. I, we, we will we'll make sure that we at least take screenshots of them. Sure. So here's a dude I know, Chris Danforth saying, I hate resilience as an aspirational term because it does not sufficiently damn those who are inflicting upon the resilient ones. I guess, I'm gonna steal that. Thanks, Chris. This is weird not being able to talk to people. Yeah. Okay, let's see if there's any others. And again, I, you know, for people who joined late, there are many people within the Little Shell community who are happy to answer questions. You know, I think Gerald takes on too much. Um, 
And there's a lot going on being a tribe newly federally recognized in the middle of a global pandemic. That really doesn't happen all that often. But, you know, reach out and, and we will answer the questions as we're able to. You know, I know it's been frustrating for a lot of people. A lot of people have expectations for things that just come up in rumor mills. And there's a lot of the sniping back and forth and all of the ugly things that happen in social media communities happen to us too. But, I, you know, if we could just be patient and make the extra effort to get along, we, we can do all this stuff. All right. Any last questions for the group? All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Karen. Okay, well, a huge thank you, Chris. Um, really amazing program. Um, I just really am grateful. And I know that our audience is very grateful as well. So thank you again. Um, a few people have asked whether or not they can get copies of your slides, but know everyone that the program will be uploaded even this evening onto our YouTube channel. Um, so for the rest of you, um, please register for upcoming programs on our website or on Facebook and watch for uploaded programs, as I just mentioned. So until next week, good night. And thank you so much, Chris. And thank you, audience. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. Take good care. You too. Bye.